Hello everybody, welcome to episode four of Kubernetes 101. Today we're going to deploy our first real world application into Kubernetes. And we're gonna find out how a traditional server architecture translates into Kubernetes container architecture. And I'm gonna make sure I'm not muted because that happens a lot and I'm not, so that's good. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me fine. Uh, please, as with all these live streams, feel free to put where you're from, who you are and uh, whatever else in here, but um, do know that if you start talking about politics or things like that, then uh, we do not care for that in this discussion. Last week we had a problem, somebody was spamming a product about Android or I don't know what, but yeah, that's, that's silly. So anyway, um, I'm glad to see everybody, uh, glad that the live chat has uh, plenty of great, um, uh, great discussion that goes on. And a lot of times I don't have the time to um, watch the, the live chat the whole time that, that I'm talking because it's kind of hard for my brain to do two things at once. And today you might be hearing some kids stomping around upstairs. That's just because they are currently uh, doing some sort of game where they run around the house quite a bit and we have wood floors and it's like a foot above my head. So anyways, um, I'm going to switch over to uh, my screen share here. Today we're going to talk about deploying a real-world application that is Drupal. Now, this, this episode gets a little bit deeper into Drupal itself than maybe some people care to, to learn about, but uh, the point of this is that um, this is a real thing that a lot of people need to do in Kubernetes. You need to take something that's more practical than just one little microservice and get it running inside of Kubernetes. So you have to worry about things like databases and things like files that get stored somewhere all the things that make it a little harder to work in a cloud native environment if you don't know what you're doing. And uh, these are also some of the things that, the reason why a lot of times somebody will switch to Kubernetes and then they pay for super expensive consultants because they didn't realize that there are still hard problems to solve in Kubernetes if you're taking applications that actually do anything useful in the world. So, um, you know, if you're gonna, just going to disable hello world go applications, it's pretty easy to scale those up infinitely in Kubernetes. But if you want to scale something that has a lot of persistence and a lot of uh, legacy, then that's going to be a little bit harder. Um, so, and, and the reason I chose Drupal for this, there's, there's a few reasons. One is I am historically a Drupal developer. That's how I got my start in programming through uh, learning some PHP to do some scripting and things. And then I realized when I was trying to build a podcast, this was in the year 2003 or four, basically when podcasting was a new thing with the iPod, um, I realized that I needed to do something more structured to make it easier to do the podcasting and media upload. And we even did some video work and things online. And so I discovered that Drupal had a lot of great functionality and plugins for that. So I got into Drupal for that. Then I did news, I did uh, nonprofits. I did lots of different huge websites for Drupal probably a number of websites that you have visited in the past couple of years. I have touched something on them. <coughs> and uh, so I have a lot of history with Drupal. Drupal is also an application that can be very difficult to scale, especially if you don't architect your Drupal website well. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly common architecture for a website. Uh, the, the LAMP stack that Drupal is built on uh, is used for a lot of different sites and uh, a similar kind of stack is used for a lot of dynamic languages like like PHP. And uh, practically speaking, I have my website jeffgearling.com, which you could visit right now and see. It's running on Drupal as well. And uh, eventually my goal, right now it's running on a single VM somewhere. Uh, my goal is to eventually get that into one of my Kubernetes clusters. So kind of a selfish reason I've been doing a lot of stuff in Kubernetes with Drupal is to, to prepare for making it super duper easy for me to get that into a Kubernetes cluster so I don't have to do a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today um, and figure out a lot of the hard problems. If I can solve the hard problems on smaller sites, then I can easily solve those problems on larger sites as well. Um, so anyway, I have a uh, a video that I'm going to show you that was pre-recorded. Unfortunately, I, I didn't uh, feel like it would be uh, easy for my computer to handle uh, all the things that I'm going to do while I'm doing the stream. Uh, so I have this video and I'm going to play it back and it's going to show you how I currently, the, the basics of how I currently set up a server and how traditionally someone would set up a server with the LAMP stack. 
I've deployed Drupal in so many ways in so many places. I used to do a ton of Drupal development and design lots and lots of sites. Nowadays, I only manage a few. I manage my jeffgearland.com website and I manage a few other sites for other people. So I, I've been through many generations of how Drupal is deployed. But still, most people, probably the majority of people that deploy Drupal, and it's the same thing with a lot of other applications that are like it, CMS is like WordPress, um, applications built on Laravel, uh, a lot of these things are built on the traditional LAMP stack. And LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Now, parts of that stack are, are interchangeable. So we say MySQL, but it could be MariaDB, it could be Postgres. Uh, it could be some other database that's compatible with whatever system you're building. And <laughs> PHP can actually be deployed a few different ways nowadays. And Apache might be uh, swapped out for something like Nginx. Um, but in general, it's the LAMP stack. And traditionally, the way that this was set up is you would have a virtual machine running in the cloud, or you would have uh, a server running somewhere, um, or you can even install everything on your local computer. And what I'm going to do is I have a example in the Kubernetes 101 repository that sets up an Ubuntu 2004 machine for you to do this testing. And if you want to follow this example yourself, but I wanted to show this process because this is where we're coming from and moving into a cloud native uh, deployment method for an application like Drupal. And no matter what the case, uh, if you're working in traditional servers, if you're working with bare metal servers, if you're working with Kubernetes, if you're working with Docker, you really have to know the underlying architecture and how things work together. And the applications themselves, like in this case, MySQL and Apache and PHP and the way Drupal runs on them, you have to know all that stuff before you can start diving right into throwing stuff into Kubernetes. If you throw it into Kubernetes and things start having problems, you're going to get so many layers deep in Kubernetes and it might just be some simple configuration problem that you're running into with how MySQL connects to Drupal or something like that. So I'm gonna run through this process fairly quickly. Uh, we'll see how long it takes on, on my computer while it's doing this recording. Uh, but I have this traditional LAMP setup example in here and you can run Vagrant up and this will bring up a virtual machine using VirtualBox. Now this assumes that you have Vagrant and VirtualBox installed on your computer. This could be work, uh, built to work with other systems too, but in my case, uh, this is what I'm using, uh, mostly for familiarity's sake and the fact that it works the same across Windows, Mac, and um, Linux. Uh, although for if you're using Linux, there might be some other virtualization tools you might wanna use that are more efficient and not encumbered by the fact that they're owned by Oracle. Um, but anyway, I'll wait for this to install or to set up the, uh, the VM. All right, now it looks like the VM is up and running. Uh, so I'm going to log into the VM with Vagrant SSH. That just SSHs me straight into the machine so I can run some commands on it. I'm gonna run sudo apt update just to make sure that all my caches are up to date. And then I'm going to install MySQL, or in this case on, on Ubuntu and Deb, the latest versions of Debian, it's MariaDB is kind of the drop-in replacement. So sudo apt install MariaDB server and MariaDB client. And once that's done, I'm going to run sudo mysql secure installation to finish the setup process. It's called mysql secure installation, but that's part of the uh, legacy of MariaDB actually using uh, mysql's naming and, and things like that for drop-in compatibility. So I'm going to run this, and I'm going to put in a password for root. Uh, extremely secure password. Um, so yes... And I'm gonna go ahead and follow all the defaults for the rest of the setup process. All right, so now I have MySQL running. I'm going to log in now as, as root. So sudo mysql-u root. That'll get me logged in. And I'm gonna create a database for Drupal. So I'm gonna grab the command out of my readme file for this. Create database Drupal. And then I'm gonna uh, create a user for Drupal that has permissions on that database identified by my password. You, if you're going to do this on your own, you should probably use a more secure password. And then uh, since I added that user, I'm going to flush privileges in MySQL and go ahead and quit out of the CLI. 
Uh, next up, I'm going to install PHP. So I'm going to, again, copy the command just because there's a lot of PHP packages that Drupal relies on uh, that need to be in your install. Otherwise, Drupal will not load up correctly. So I'm going to grab that command, and it's php cli fpm json common mysql zip gd intel internationalization mb string curl xml pair tidy soap bc math and xml rpc. It's going to go ahead and install all those packages. And once that's done, it's time to install Apache. And in my case, just to make things simple, I'm going to install PHP with mod. Uh, I'm going to install Apache using mod PHP to connect PHP to Apache. This is the older traditional way to do it. Although, if you're going to build a more modern hosting setup, you might want to use FPM instead. But that is something completely unrelated to Kubernetes 101 because now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how to deploy PHP in infrastructure. And there's many ways to do that, just like there is for any programming language that uses dynamic scripts like PHP. Uh, so I'm going to say sudo apt install dash y apache2 lib apache2 mod php. Uh, that'll get me uh, what I need for that, and it's there. And then I need to configure a couple things for PHP. So sudo nano uh, etsy slash php 7.4 is the version that's installed. Apache 2 php.ini. And in here, I need to edit a couple things. So I'm going to find memory limit. Technically, Drupal could run on like 256, but I'm going to give it 512 because that's always a little safer. I'm also going to change uh, the date time zone setting, um, just because that makes it uh, easier for Drupal to use the right times and things. America slash Chicago, even though I live in St. Louis, uh, Chicago is apparently a much larger city that's in the same time zone. And then I'm going to uh, edit the, uh, I'm going to create a file that tells Apache about my Drupal site. And you know, you might be thinking at this point, why are you doing all this? Again, it's because you really need to understand the things that are going on behind the scenes. And one of the things that happens is, whether you're using Apache or Nginx or something like that, you need to give it the right configurations to be able to know where your code base is for your website, uh, where to serve files, how to serve them, and all those things. So I'm going to edit, I'm going to create a new Drupal configuration, which contains a virtual host for Drupal. So uh, sudo nano. Uh, Etsy, Apache 2, sites in a, uh, available. I can't type today. Uh, Drupal.conf. And inside here, I'm going to paste in my virtual host block. And I'm not going to deep dive into what all this is, but basically it's giving us uh, a name for the server and uh, where, that, where that document root is going to be located. And we haven't set this up yet, but I will soon. And I'm going to save this file. Uh, but I'm not going to restart Apache yet. After you add this file into Apache's configuration, then you have to restart Apache to pick it up. But since it doesn't exist, Apache will fail if I try doing that. So the next step is I'm going to install Composer uh, by downloading the installer from the web and running PHP Composer Setup. And that downloads a composer.far file, which I can use, but I'm going to move that. Uh, into a, a directory in my path so I can just run composer command. So move composer.far into slash user slash local slash bin slash composer. And now I can run composer and use composer, which is PHP's kind of package and repository project management tool. Um, and then I can use composer to create a Drupal project. So first, I'm going to set the permissions on the www directory so that Apache and, in turn, uh, Composer and, and Drupal can work with it. So I'm going to say sudo chone-r uh, www-data, and that again, var www. And then I'm going to create a Drupal code base. And um, the demonstration I'm going to show you in Kubernetes today actually skips over a lot of this stuff because it's all kind of magically wired up together for you. But again, the reason I'm showing this is because I want to show you that all of these steps are important in making sure that Drupal is running securely inside of uh, an environment on a VM. And in Kubernetes, some of these things, we worry about them in different ways. Some of these things we worry about in the same way. In this case, I want to make sure that the Apache web user has the permissions to be able to work with this, this file system. 
And um, there are some different concerns that you might have running uh, a VM like this uh, in a cloud environment versus running it in um, a, a Docker container, especially if your container is isolated in a Kubernetes cluster or isolated via Podman and not running as root on a system. Um, so anyways, uh, I've created that and then I'm going to switch to the www data user. So sudo su l www data dash s bin bash that lets me log in as this this user to run this next command, which, which is going to create my Drupal site. So composer create project Drupal recommended project var www slash html slash Drupal. So that's going to download all of the tools that Drupal needs into its code base directory. And this is basically creating me a new Drupal site. And you can see it's going to download Drupal 9.1, which is the latest version just released a week ago, I think. And it's downloading all of Drupal's dependencies into that folder. So it gives you all this guide and, and stuff here. But basically what that did is if I uh, ls that directory var www.html Drupal, uh, that installs Drupal into this directory using Composer so that I can use Composer, which is a PHP dependency management tool to manage my Drupal code base and, and how everything works together. Uh, so I did that. I'm going to exit out of that uh, Apache users account now and finish setting things up. So I'm going to use sudo and use Apache 2's uh, tools to enable certain modules and sites and things and then restart Apache. So a2 and mod uh, rewrite, um, and then sudo a2 n site drupal.conf. So that enables that Drupal configuration I added earlier. sudo a2 dis site. I'm going to disable the default site that comes with Apache default.conf. And finally, sudo system control. And notice it's system control, not system cuddle. Anyway, so if I say QB. Oh, QB cuddle, cube control, whatever. We'll keep coming back to that, I'm sure. Uh, restart Apache 2. And now at this point, if I go into my web browser and I go to the IP address 192.168.80.80, uh, it should take me to the Drupal site. And it's not installed or anything yet, but it's you can see that everything is running now. So if I save this and continue, uh, I'll just choose the standard installation profile, I guess. I can put in the database credentials. So we, cr we created a Drupal Drupal database with the username Drupal and the password, my password, highly secure. Um, if we were running the database on a different server, you could change that here. But uh, we're running everything in one stack and one VM, the LAMP stack. And uh, you can see that Drupal is installing. And after it finishes, we should see that Drupal is here. And again, I, I have to reiterate, you're probably never going to do that, especially if you're watching this and not if you're not a Drupal user. I know some of the people watching this live stream are Drupal users, like myself. But um, but it's to show you that there is a complexity to running these things, and even if you try to use some magical layers on top of things to manage your applications for you, you have to understand how those things work together. Why did we change the permissions on the www data directory? Um, how does that help things? Um, because some of these things you're going to run into issues in Kubernetes, and it's going to misdirect you sometimes if you don't know how how Drupal interacts with the database and how Drupal interacts with the file system and how PHP and Apache work together. So uh, sometimes I think people get into Kubernetes and think that it's just kind of some magical varnish you put on top of infrastructure, and you don't have to worry about your applications, you don't have to worry about connections between them and networking and things. In my opinion, you have to know all that stuff even better if you want to do Kubernetes well, I would not be able to be productive with Kubernetes if I didn't understand all those underlying layers well. And uh, so that's one thing that I caution, you know, if a company is like, oh, we can just throw Kubernetes on top of our stuff and it's easy. Developers can deploy their applications and it all works great. It's not that way. You, you still have to understand all those things. So anyways, I'm going to hand things back over to me again. Uh, it's always a, a fun thing to be talking to myself. So hello, Jeff, in the future. Yes, hello indeed. Um, thanks so much to Jay Rogers and uh, Scott for uh, the, the super chat donations. Um, one interesting thing, yesterday was uh, GitHub sponsors, 
and sorry for going on a little tangent, but yesterday uh, was GitHub Universe. And um, one, one thing that that reminded me of is that this year I have had a number of people sponsor my open source work on GitHub, which is basically the reason why I was able to get into this YouTube channel more, get my Kubernetes 101 series and all that. So thank you so much. And if you do want to uh, sponsor my work and, and help to make these things happen a little more often, um, please consider that. I think there's links in the description. If there's not, I can add them for my uh, GitHub sponsors and Patreon and things like that. But um, that process that I talked about, it might seem antiquated, uh, and it is antiquated. It, some people actually do still administer servers like that, just like some people still use FTP to upload their web files, and not just secure FTP, but there are still people using FTP. Um, and uh, it is an antiquated process, but I haven't really done that for many years now. Probably 2013, 2014 was the last time I remember sitting there with a run book and typing commands like that to set up a server. Nowadays, we use uh, tools like configuration management, like Ansible. And uh, somebody was mentioning the Ansible. This is a rare artifact. I don't even remember where I got this one, but I remember getting it and thinking, I have to take very good care of this because there's not many like it. Uh, but it's like a little squeezy toy. But it's a play on words, Ansible, and this is a bowl. Anyway, um, so Ansible itself, if you, if you, it's just like with Kubernetes. If you dove into something like I, I created a tool called Drupal VM that lets you build basically all the stuff you saw there, but way more configurable. And all you have to do is change a few settings and you can have your finely tuned Drupal server running locally inside a virtual machine, uh, just like I did with all those manual steps, but it only takes a couple minutes to set it up. And you, you can either use the defaults or change a couple settings. But Ansible itself is kind of magic if you don't know what everything is doing underneath. And I think a lot of people getting started with Kubernetes see Kubernetes as a layer of magic as well. And, and um, a lot of times they might start using tools because vendors are sometimes the, the biggest perpetrator of this issue of saying, well, when you switch to Kubernetes, you don't have to worry about this and that and storage and all these different things. But really, they're trying to mask some complex things that you still have to worry about in some different ways. And so um, I, I uh, also pre-recorded this a little bit uh, where I'm going to talk about deploying Drupal with Helm, which I think Helm is, Helm is great for a lot of use cases and a lot of different things. But I think a lot of people also get into Kubernetes and start using Helm without understanding what it's doing and how it works and things. Uh, so I wanted to show how to deploy Drupal with Helm and show kind of a little bit of that magic and how it can mask some of the, some of the complexity that we just talked about. On the topic of magic and Kubernetes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Helm, and we're going to install Drupal using Helm. Now, Helm on its homepage calls itself the package manager for Kubernetes. And I would like to say that I kind of disagree with that statement about what Helm is, or at least what Helm should be. Um, because I see a lot of people pick up something like Helm, which is a great tool and a great way to um, create and share and distribute and update your applications in Kubernetes. It's one of many different options, um, and it's, it's one of the most supported and most widely known options. But a lot of people pick it up, and right at the beginning of their Kubernetes journey, they, they hop into to Helm, find a chart that they like, and just start using that to deploy their applications. But they never really understand what the chart is doing. And so many of the Helm charts, especially the most popular ones for some applications that are harder to deploy, do so many things underneath that you might never even understand how it all works. And when things break, you're going to have a lot of trouble figuring that out. So I typically like to approach things from the other end of, of the spectrum. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But I want to show you how you could use Helm to deploy Drupal. And, and one thing that I do like a lot about Helm is the fact that there are a lot of charts out there that will get something deployed in your cluster quickly. And especially when you're doing development, testing, or trying to get a reference for how to do something in Kubernetes, there's a lot of Helm charts out there that can help you with that. Uh, so that's that's what I typically use Helm for, is kind of kicking myself off on a new project, trying to figure out how other people are doing it. Helm often has a great reference for how to do it. And I could even pull the definitions that Helm generates out of my cluster to help me get started on my own definitions. So uh, this is helm.sh, the, the homepage for Helm. has some good documentation. You can get links to how to get help with Helm, things like that. 
but the place that I usually go to find things is the Artifact Hub, and it's artifacthub.io, and it searches through all the Helm charts that are publicly available. And so I, I can search for something like Drupal, and there's actually, an, well, it's unofficial, but it's, it's a pretty popular um, Helm chart for Drupal from a, an organization called Bitnami. And to add a Helm chart, it's pretty simple. The first thing that you need to do is make sure that you have Helm installed on your computer. So I'm gonna say uh, brew install Helm, because I use brew to manage most things on my computer. It's already on my computer, spoilers. Um, but you can also download the binary just like many other tools in Kubernetes. You just download it to your computer, put it in your path, and you'll have it there. Um, or there's other ways to install it too if you go to, to the Helm documentation. Uh, but once you have Helm, there's only two things that you have to do. You have to add, add a repository. So in this case, Bitnami maintains a repository that has the definition of this Drupal Helm chart. Uh, and so we can do that with this command, Helm repo add Bitnami. So I'll put that in there. And uh, it looks like I already actually did this, so it's on my computer. But if it, it wasn't, then it would download it to your computer. Uh, and then you can create a release. And in Helm, a release is basically like an instance of your application. So I'm going to go ahead and install, um, install an instance of Drupal. And I'm not going to call it my release. I'm just going to call it my site. So my site, and I should say that I have a Kubernetes cluster running in the background just with Minikube. I ran Minikube start uh, before this, and I, so I have my Minikube cluster running. So when I do this, it's going to uh, use Helm to grab that chart and put in all the default configuration that that chart has and put it into my Kubernetes cluster. Now, there's a ton more options for Helm. I'm not going to get a deep dive into Helm today. That's not what this episode is about. Um, but at the end of it, it spits out some information. And uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to be able to get to this Drupal thing. So it, it deployed stuff for me, and that's where the magic is here. Uh, it defines things like how to get a database running and how to get Drupal and Apache and PHP up and running. It gets me a Drupal code base for free, all this kind of stuff. So that's nice, but um, now I need to be able to access the Drupal site in Kubernetes. So I'm going to use the command up here, uh, kubectl get service, and it's in the default namespace. That's where we're still working right now. Um, and uh, it's my site Drupal, and that's the service that I'm trying to get. And right now it says that the external IP is pending, and it's a load balancer. So one quick thing to note, and this is one, one area where some people start running into issues earlier in their Kubernetes career, because they go into a cloud infrastructure provider like Amazon, and they start deploying these things, and they might have 25 Drupal instances, and then they realize that the default is to use a load balancer. And you need to know these things because load balancers on Amazon use, uh, I think, ALBs or ELBs by default, whatever the case, they cost money. And if you deploy 25 sites and those sites all cost, I don't remember what the price is right now, but you know, let's say 20 bucks a month, 20 times 25, that's starting to be a lot of money just for the fact that it's using load balancers. There are other ways to deploy things and have them accessible besides load balancers that can save you a lot of money and make things easier for you. Um, but that's kind of an aside. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm showing these different ways of deploying before we get into deploying it the way that I like to start things off. Um, there's no external IP, and, and we can watch this forever. There's not going to be one right now because I'm using Minikube, and Minikube doesn't have an external load balancer. But Minikube can actually emulate an external load balancer by kind of building a tunnel in the background. So I'm going to create another uh, terminal session because this is a foreground operation. I could background it, but I'm just going to uh, open a new terminal session and run the command Minikube tunnel. And when I run this, it's going to set up a, a tunnel into Minikube for my computer that can be used for load balancing. And after I do that, in a few seconds, let me switch back to this screen. You can see, oh, it's asking for my pseudo password, so I'll put that in. And now it's getting an external IP here. So now I can take this external IP address and bring it over into my browser and I'll make a new tab and visit it, and I can see the Drupal site. So uh, this is a quick way to get things running. Like you know, this is Drupal, and, and you saw how complex it was to install it on a VM. And you might be thinking at this point, "Wow, this is great! I should just get into Kubernetes and start using Helm and deploy things this way." But there are some concerns that I have. One is this fact that it uses a load balancer by default. Uh, another is the fact that there's a lot of underlying configuration that went on that you saw that I had to do manually before. So how, how can we just skip all that? 
we want to understand what's going on behind the scenes before we start doing things like using public Helm charts or even building our own Helm charts uh, because there's a lot of complexity that's masked there. So uh, one, one quick note is that you can override all these things. Like I can change the load balancer. If I go back over to the documentation for this chart uh, and go to the values schema, it shows you all these different options that you can change. And you can change the service type uh, which is default as load balancer. And you can change it to a node port like we used in the previous episode or a cluster IP. Uh, and you can change many, many different uh, options in here. But again, if you don't know what these things do, it's a good idea to start from the foundation and learn what these things do. And then you can start using all these tools on top of Kubernetes to manage them for you. Anyways, I'm going to hand it back over to myself and we can talk about another way of deploying Drupal that lets you understand the basics and how this chart actually works. Thank you, me. Um, and thank you also to Corrupt Corey and Scott Dexter for uh, the sponsorship and, and chat, uh, the super chat. Um, speaking, before we get off the topic of magic in infrastructure, I wanted to say that not all kinds of magic are bad magic. And that reminds me of this series sponsor, Amazie.io. They are a company that gives you the right type of magic in the right places. They make using Kubernetes feel like magic because of the fact that they manage your infrastructure for you and make your Kubernetes clusters work well so that you can focus on just running your applications and as a side note for today, they are Drupal specialists. And the reason that I um, actually knew about them and, and know a lot of the people that work for Amazie is uh, because, in my opinion, they are amazing people who have, uh, have been uh, part of the Drupal community for years. And um, they're probably one of the best uh, companies on the planet that knows Drupal the deepest and, and can run it really well in infrastructure. So it's a double win if you're using Drupal and you want to run it on Kubernetes. Anyways, you can check them out at amazie.io. Um, so I, I want to talk about deploying Drupal into a multi-node Kubernetes cluster. And I'm going to use a cluster that I'm running on Linode. Uh, so I'm going to switch back over to my screen here. And you can see I have a cluster running for episode four. Uh, it has three servers. Uh, three servers, each one has, uh, what, through four gigs of RAM or something like that. 12 divided by three is four, yeah and uh, two CPU cores. So it, it, this is more of a real world. It's a very small, small cluster, but <clears throat> uh, this is a cluster that, that gives us the opportunity to see what happens when we deploy Drupal onto a, a real Kubernetes cluster with multiple nodes and uh, see some of the, the issues that we might start running into. <coughs> and uh, sorry about that. Um, the, uh, I, I have an example in the project for this website. So if, if you don't know about it, if you go to cube101.jeffgearland.com, I have links to all the episodes, um, a link to the YouTube channel, a link to my book, which is still $4.99 right now until the end of the series. It's on sale. Um, uh, this book, a lot of the examples from this, uh, this series actually come out of the book. Even though it's Ansible for Kubernetes, it covers a lot of generic Kubernetes things because of the fact that Ansible is just automating those things that you do in Kubernetes that we're covering in this course. Uh, but there's a link over here to the Kubernetes 101 project, which has examples from every episode. And in here, I have an, the example that I'm going to deploy to a cluster. Uh, and we're going to show kind of behind, behind the scenes of that Helm chart what a lot of things are doing and uh, talk about the way that the, the actual deployment is structured. So th there's actually a readme here that, that guides you through it if you want to do this after the episode. The readme is probably going to have more detail than I give you just because uh, on the fly it's hard for me to remember all of the talking points that I want to hit. Um, but I have these two uh, manifests. And when you're working in Kubernetes, you're going to deal with home charts which have templates which look similar to this. Um, you're going to deal with raw manifests like this. Uh, you're going to be deploying operators to your cluster and things. Everything you deploy is going to have a definition of what the object is. And 99% of the time, we're going to be working in YAML. So you're going to want to get yourself familiar with YAML. And if you have an editor, like I'm using Sublime Text 3, uh, but if you're using VS Code or whatever editor you're using, you're going to want to make sure you have YAML syntax highlighting. And ideally, you could integrate a linter that would also uh, check things like making sure you're using spaces instead of tabs. It's a little hard to see that on your screen probably, but uh, I have a, a plugin that, that lets me see 
uh, if there's trailing space, so I can make sure that's gone. Uh, it shows me the, the characters, uh, whether they're spaces or tabs, and I can set the defaults uh, for tab width to use spaces so that YAML is happy with me when I'm editing it and uh, adding it. Um, anyway, so we're gonna talk about these things. As I said in the first uh, part of this episode, when you deploy Drupal, you're gonna need the LAMP stack, basically. In, in this case, we're substituting Linux. It's still gonna be Linux underneath everything, unless you're gonna run this in a Windows Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but we're gonna need Linux um, on the base, which is going to be our operating system running the containers and things. The container's gonna set things up for us, but uh, we're going to have Apache and PHP, just like we did in that first example, running together in one container, and then we're gonna have a database in another container. But to get those things to run in Kubernetes, you need a few more resources. So for a database, uh, what, what you don't want to have happen is you deploy your database and it's running well and then uh, you know your, your server restarts or something and then all of a sudden your database goes away because you didn't have any persistence. You didn't have a, a storage volume where the database was stored because with containers, containers are ephemeral. That means that they, they will go out of existence and all the data inside of them except for what's in the container image will go away. So anything that we want to store and have be persistent, we have to have stored somewhere. And in Kubernetes, most of the time, the way that you would store things is using a persistent volume claim or PVC. And different Kubernetes clusters will have different ways of setting up storage. And some of them give you multiple options. Other ones only might give you one or two out of the box. And you might have to set up different storage classes and things, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, for now, you just need to know that if you need storage, you need to claim storage from your cluster. And most clusters like Minikube and Linode and Amazon uh, will give you a default way of getting storage. Like in Amazon, it would be an EBS volume. In uh, Linode, it would be a Linode block device, I think, or Linode volume, uh, whatever these things are, block storage. Um, and in Minikube, it would be a local volume on the Minikube instance. Uh, so. The first thing that we need is a, is a persistent volume claim that's going to tell us, or that's going to be able to be used with your uh, database uh, so that the database can write things to uh, a persistent place that will not go away even if your container dies or your cluster is restarted or something like that. Um, and Owain, I do not uh, stream on Twitch, unfortunately. Um, YouTube is, has been a lot easier for me to work with lately. So um, anyway, so with your persistent volume claim or PVC, you want to give it a, a request for how much storage you need. Typically, you, you want to go higher than lower. I'm just doing this because this is a demo. I, I, don't, need, I don't even need a gig. Uh, but if you're, it's, it's typically better to give yourself a little more room and padding because some storage providers make it more difficult to expand or move to a new persistent volume or something like that. That's just a tip from uh, years of usage. There are a lot of storage providers that let you have more flexible storage uh, options, uh, but that's just something that I, I would always give about two to four times as much as I can imagine needing uh, for, for my persistent volumes that I use. Um, the next thing is the deployment of MySQL. Now, this right now, this particular uh, resource definition, this, this manifest for Kubernetes is not what I would call a production grade one. This is more of a demonstration one. And that's how I like, when I'm learning something like Kubernetes, I don't wanna dive into show me the production grade, fully secured, 100% ready thing. I wanna see how something works first, and then I'm gonna start pulling things out. So you might notice, if you know much about Kubernetes, you might notice that there's no secret here. Like you need a secret for a database and you need this and that. I'm not gonna do that yet. Um, so don't, you know, I know some people, your alarm bells are probably going off, but don't worry about that, we'll get to it later. Uh, but we need storage and we need the definition of how to deploy the database into the cluster. And we're gonna use a deployment for this. I'm going to talk later. Again, alarm bells might be going off. There are people watching this that should really be in like a Kubernetes 502 or something. Um, you know, Don't worry, we're going to talk about replica sets soon. But for now, we're talking about deploying a database into the cluster. We're gonna have one replica and I'm gonna tell you why in a little bit. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the basic way to define a deployment in a cluster. So all these different things, once you start doing enough Kubernetes, you'll, you'll understand uh, what all these fields mean and things. For now, I would say starting out, um, 
copy and paste a, uh, a definition and then tweak it. Uh, but you'll, you'll start to understand that uh, the metadata defines like the name and namespace usually, but there's some other things you get to find in there. Uh, match labels is used for kind of labeling a thing inside of Kubernetes, and you can use this in different powerful and flexible ways. For now, I'm just doing a simple, uh, a simple one for the app name equals MariaDB. Technically, you don't even need to do some of these things, but it's, it's a general best practice to do a lot of these things. Um, the most important part of deployments and the part that you'll be tweaking the most is the spec under spec template spec, because this is how you'll define what runs for this deployment. And you can actually have more, I mentioned this a few episodes ago, you can have more than one container in a pod. So you could have, I could do all of Drupal's deployment with a database and Drupal inside of one pod with two containers. If I wanted to do that, I don't want to do that because I want to manage the database separately from Drupal. Um, but there's many different ways you can deploy things into Kubernetes, including that. And I'm going to talk about uh, a little uh, special thing that you can do inside of here as well with the Drupal deployment. Uh, but in here, this is where the meat of things is. If you, uh, if you know much about Docker, you'll, this is very similar. This, this looks in some ways a lot like a Docker Compose file. Now, with resource limits and things, this would be Docker Compose version 2 versus 3. Um, but a lot of these things are similar because you define things like environment variables, uh, you define the ports that the container is going to use, you define the image, uh, the name for the container, and uh, volumes that it might be mounting into the container. Uh, so all these different things help tell Kubernetes, when I run this container, I want to run it using this Docker image. And in this case, it'll come from Docker Hub. If you're coming from a private repository, or somewhere else, you might need to put the server name slash namespace and all that kind of stuff uh, that we talked about, uh, I think, last episode or two episodes ago. And um, and and like I said, this uh, putting your MySQL password in line like this and using a password that's really simple to, to hack like Drupal is probably not a great idea. Um, and we'll talk about uh, better ways to do that soon. Um, but this is how, it, and the way that I got all these variables was I looked in the MariaDB Docker image documentation and it said, define these variables if you want to have a database set up for you when you run this container. So we set those up in the environment and those will tell the container, the MariaDB container, to set up a database when it starts the first time. And then the most important thing for our database is to make sure that the var lib MySQL, and, and this again is documented in the MariaDB container documentation, we want to make sure that that directory is mounted as a persistent volume so that when the container loads the first time, this will be loading from a block storage device or some other storage folder that's persistent and outside of the container's lifecycle. And it will be mounted into this path from this volume claim. So again, the syntax here, you'll, you'll start picking it up the more you do this. But um, I started out by, I would take a resource definition I knew worked, copy it, uh, start tweaking things, start understanding the structure of it that way. Uh, some people's brains work a little differently. Um, you might want to read the documentation for things more. I, I tend to work better by taking something that works, modifying it, seeing how that changes things, and then learning from there. So anyway, this, this is the most important thing for this database. We want to make sure that the, the volume is used that we set up up here, this persistent volume claim and it is mounted into the container in this path where MySQL, or in this case, MariaDB, will be looking for that database, uh, all the files that it stores, uh, all the data for Drupal in. And then the last little thing here is resource limits. This is something you you'd actually don't have to define these when you're beginning with Kubernetes. You might not even care too much about them just because uh, it's extra work to deal with them. And if you, if you try deploying like, uh, two copies of Drupal into a cluster that has one CPU. This will not work because it's trying to use half of a CPU. 500M is 500 milli or something. It's half of one. Um, and so I, I do this for almost everything I run in production, though, just because you don't want to be surprised when one of your pods starts going insane. And then uh, you know it takes up all the CPU on one of your servers. Because these things are sharing the same server for multiple pods, especially if you are running lots of things in your cluster. Uh, so it's a good idea to have to keep tabs on your limits and things. And this is something that we might go into a little more in detail later. But uh, for now, just know that you can cap uh, resource limits for CPU memory and even some other things too. But we won't get into that in this course. 
Finally, uh, we have a, de a deployment. We have MariaDB running in our cluster after we deploy this. We haven't done that yet. And we need to be able to get to that from Drupal. So we need to be able to tell Kubernetes, set up a service. And we've dealt with services before. The service is just going to be kind of an internal Kubernetes load balancing thing that lets you send requests to a DNS name uh, or a cluster IP address that Kubernetes is going to set up for us inside the cluster. And that service is going to route port 3306 on it into this container on port 3306, which we expose up here. So, uh, so far we have MariaDB set up and it will be able to, uh, the other thing about services that's important is to set a selector that matches the, uh, the label up here, um, on here, so that uh, when the service is set up, it routes the request to the right container. So anyways, this is what that service does. And technically, the service could work with multiple uh, MariaDB containers running at the same time if you set replicas to two or three. But uh, I'm going to talk about why that is, can be dangerous here in a minute. So anyway. We have this, and uh, one of the things you might have noticed in all these definitions is something that might be new to you. Um, we, we br I briefly mentioned it last episode, but namespace. Uh, namespaces are something that you're going to want to make sure you always are using in Kubernetes because it's a way to separate out different uh, things that are running in your cluster into their own little isolated area. So if I have a namespace Drupal here, which I'm going to use also in the Drupal definitions, that namespace allows me to set up this MySQL server in the Drupal namespace, and it will be accessible inside the Drupal namespace, but it will not be accessible through the service outside of the Drupal namespace. And there's other things that you can set up per namespace. Uh, for instance, we talked about uh, pull secrets, and that was the first time I mentioned namespaces. Um, pull secrets are specific to a particular namespace, so that lets you do things like run different uh, workloads in different namespaces and not have them necessarily be able to tie into each other. There are ways to kind of uh, punch holes in things, but by default, it's, it's uh, a pretty easy way to isolate resources from each other inside a Kubernetes cluster. And we're not going to deep dive into security in Kubernetes in this course, uh, but that's just something to keep in mind and something to research more if you are, especially if you're running multiple different applications that you really don't want to see don't want to have them be able to see each other, there are some security concerns that you still need to go a little deeper on. Um, most of the clusters that I run, you're running one client in a cluster or one set of applications that should be able to work together. Usually it's through HTTP APIs, so they can be in separate namespaces. namespaces. Um, but that's, uh, that's just something to keep in mind. If you are going to be running like multiple clients in one cluster, there's a lot more that you might need to be concerned about. Anyways, so there is um, our MariaDB definition. I made a change. Oh, I, I just added spaces. I see this little dot up here, and I'm like, oh, I made a change. I don't know what I did. Um, all right, so that's MariaDB. The Drupal one is similar, but there's a little bit of a difference here. So down here, there's a, a persistent volume claim because Drupal has a file system that it needs to be able to write to when you upload images and things like that. And it has a deployment. Um, I'm going to get to that soon, and a service to expose Drupal to the outside in this case. But Drupal has one more thing that you'll be using a lot of, and it's called a config map. And this is, this is one way to do it. Uh, there's, there's probably 10 different ways to set up a Drupal site in Kubernetes and configure it with the right settings for database, password, and all those kind of things. This is one way to do it. And like I mentioned here, this is not the most secure way to do this. This is a quick and hacky way to do it. Uh, but Drupal needs to know how to connect to a database. Um, it needs to know a hash salt that it uses for generating uh, password reset links and things like that. It also needs to know, um, right here, I, th I think this is like, allow any host to access it. That's not secure. You should definitely configure whatever host names your site is going to operate on. And it gives a directory for uh, configuration files to be written to. And this is the public file system directory. And the only reason I'm doing this is to make this uh, demo a little simpler. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more next episode about Drupal a little bit beyond this and ways to make all these things a little more secure. But the point is that Drupal does need settings available to it that when you launch the container, you have to inject those somehow. 
This is one way of doing it. This is going to write a settings.php file that tells Drupal all the stuff it needs to know about how to start up and connect to a database. There's other ways you can do it. You could, you could build your Drupal site <coughs> in a Docker image in a way that actually pulls environment variables in and you can pass environment variables. You can also write a secrets file to the file system somewhere and read those in. Uh, and different applications can be diff configured in different ways. Drupal is not what I would call a 12 factor application. Uh, and there's a website here that, that talks about this. The idea is that your application could be <laughs> portable and easy to run in any place. And 12 factor apps are typically very easy to get running in Kubernetes because they are built cloud first. Drupal is not quite like that. And a lot of applications that you run are not going to be full 12 factor apps. And an app, an app doesn't have to be 12 factor to be a good app that's easy to run in Kubernetes, but there are going to be some things like this where you have to write a settings file or can change your application a little bit to pull in things from, uh, from the environment or from a secrets file or something like that. So anyways, that is a config map. And config maps are just stored in Kubernetes' own database as a blob. So this is going to be a blob of data that contains a settings.php uh, some text. And, and this is a little YAML shorthand for take all the data in here. So what this, what this little thing, I f it's folded scale, not a folded scalar. I don't remember exactly what this is called. But what this says is basically take this block of text that's right here. Uh, and then what it's going to do is it's going to put that into a file that looks like this and is PHP when it's written. And so the file will look like this. So it, it preserves the line breaks in here, but it takes out any white space that would be over in this area. Um, and it, this is also a fun fact for Trivia Night, if that ever happens again and we're all in person somewhere. This is called the chomping indicator. So it chomps off any, uh, any new lines or white space at the end. So if you had some white space, it would chomp that off and you just end up with this. So that's a config map. Um, we'll, we'll probably see a few more of these as we go along. And I made a change in here. There's that little dot. Uh, what did I do? OK. Um, the next thing is a persistent volume claim. So this is going to be for Drupal to write files when you upload, when, when users upload things to their files, uh, to their Drupal file system, like images or media files or anything like that. They will be written in here. Uh, this will also allow Drupal to write things like configurations and, and stuff like that. Um, you could. You could use, so I believe that the Helm chart actually does it a little differently and writes the entire Drupal code base, I believe, to the persistent volume, which I don't like. Uh, that's not a Kubernetes way to do it, I don't think. Uh, it is a valid way to do it. I, I, don't, I'm, I like to have my entire code base for my application as part of the Docker image. So I like to have all the code be in the image, and then you inject a few folders that need to be shared, like this files directory, instead of having the code run off an external volume that's mounted into your container. Anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more probably in the next episode as well. Uh, but we need a place to write files, so we have that. And in here, we're going to use that down here under volume mounts, uh, Drupal files. And here's that Drupal files PVC under volumes. So we need that. The other thing that we're doing with that settings file is we're using, we're going to use it as a volume mount. and and you can see that there's a way to do that in Kubernetes. You can take a config map and mount it as a volume. And I, you can do this kind of thing with, with Docker as well. You can take a file and mount it straight in. And uh, so we can take a config map and mount it straight into Drupal's default folder, where it's going to pick it up as the settings for the Drupal site uh, that we're going to run. And that is mounted here. Um, so. Some of the stuff you're not going to make, you're not going to understand it all in the first go round. But once you start building things uh, with Kubernetes, you can you can start uh, start seeing those how things connect together. Uh, a couple other things that are going on here. First of all, this is not necessary. This init container thing is not necessary if you're running this in Minikube, but it is necessary on Linode because of some uh, volume permissions differences. And that's where it comes in when I talked about earlier in this episode, how it's important to understand how everything works underneath. You need to know how Drupal file system, uh, Drupal's files directory works to make sure that you can deploy it correctly in Kubernetes. Otherwise, you start running into permissions errors. Users are uploading images, and they're getting error messages and things. Uh, what this does is before the, the Drupal container starts, 
it changes the permissions on the, um, the default files directory to be owned by the www data user that's inside of this uh, Drupal, Drupal Docker image. And uh, the reason it does that is we don't necessarily know what what the user uh, G, GID or UID is going to be before we launch the container. There's there's a couple other ways we can do this as well. In Kubernetes, there's always 10 ways to do everything. Um, but this way is simple and uh, is also recommended in the, in the Linode documentation. But if we don't do this, then Drupal gets an error when it tries installing because it can't actually write to the files directory because it's owned by root and doesn't have write permissions. So. Uh, that's that's one thing that you can do. And th the cool thing is with this is Kubernetes will run any init containers prior to starting up the container. So you can do things like prep files. Uh, I remember with Magento, uh, you had to build the themes and you couldn't, you couldn't pre-build your themes you, for some crazy reason, in my opinion, it's crazy. You had to have a running website connected to a database to build your theme assets, which was, uh, sorry, anyway. Uh, total tangent there, but you can use init containers to initialize files on your container or to copy things across places or to set up something. You could even use it to do an automated install of Drupal or something like that if you wanted to. Um, anyway, so that's, that's init containers. And then we're back to our normal container definition. And uh, another difference in here, uh, it's just using the Drupal image. Uh, it's exposing port 80. Um, and it has the volumes and it has resource limits. But another difference here is we're using liveness and readiness probes to let Kubernetes know uh, you can define whether or not a pod is working and ready and responding to requests. And that's used in Kubernetes if I, well, I, I don't have it running yet, but if you get uh, deployments and it shows like zero of one is, is running, uh, you can define whether or not that's gonna be zero of one or one of one um, by saying, uh, is, is this container ready when uh, you, you basically say like when it can, when it can be connected to on port 80 it's ready and then it also can do a liveness probe which checks every uh, I forget how often it checks uh, by default but it will wait 30 seconds before checking the first time to check if the the container is still running and if it's not if it says it's unhealthy it's not live then it will kill that container and bring up a new one uh, to make sure that it, it comes up healthy. You have to be careful with these things though. I don't always define them for everything I'm running, but for a lot of things I do, but you have to be careful if you, if you make it too, if you make the probes be too frequent or you don't give the right delay, Kubernetes can get stuck in a loop where it keeps killing your container because it takes 35 seconds for the container to start, but you're doing the probe in 30 seconds and then it kills it and starts it again. It takes another 30 seconds. So just be careful with that. Um, all right, so that's that's our Drupal our Drupal deployment, and we're just going to deploy one replica for now. Uh, that's also what the Helm chart that we deployed did. Uh, and then finally, we're going to expose it. In this case, we're going to use a node port just for simplicity's sake. Next episode, we'll talk a little bit more about other options. And again, this is going to expose uh, port 80 on every node in our cluster using a random port that's that's a high port, and it's going to uh, route that port 80 to port 80 on any container matching this selector app Drupal, which is again defined up in here. And um, so now I want to deploy those things. So finally, uh, again, this is using the namespace Drupal. So it'll be, uh, it'll be isolated inside that namespace. And I know I'm running a little bit over time today, but I wanted to get this done so we can get deep into things in the next episode. Um, so I have my Kubernetes cluster up here and I'm going to make sure I can connect to it. Export uh, cube config equals linode, uh, no, dot cube slash linode, and then cube control git nodes, just make sure I can connect. Should see three nodes, yep, I do. Uh, so I'm going to first create this namespace. Before you can deploy anything into a namespace, you have to create it, otherwise you'll get an error message. So I'm gonna say kubectl create namespace Drupal and kubectl apply dash f Maria DB. Uh, oh, I'm not in the right. I need to actually get into that directory. Hub uh, CD 101 uh, episode 04 and Kate's manifests. All right, kubectl apply dash f Maria DB. And what this does is it takes this entire file 
takes all the definitions inside and individually applies them. So this one, and then this one, and then the other one. And the order doesn't really matter that much because Kubernetes, you can deploy the service and it's just gonna sit there looking for any containers with this selector for now and forever. And whether or not there's a container, it's gonna be working um, and routing requests. Of course, they fail if there's no container running. So I could have deployed the service first. I just like to deploy things in this way. I usually deploy any persistent things that are required, so config maps and secrets and volumes and things. Then I put the deployment and then I put the service and we'll get to ingress and things like that later. Um, so I, I like to do things that way just because that's how my mental map of how these things relate to each other works. Um, so anyway, there's MariaDB and you can see that it created these three resources. And uh, I'm also going to deploy Drupal. So I'm gonna say drupal.yaml and then I can watch with kubectl get deployments dash n drupal. And uh, I added dash n drupal because every command that you run with kubectl or cube control needs to be uh, run inside of whatever namespace you're running. If I do this, I'll do this uh, without dash n drupal. And you'll see that there is, uh, there's nothing, so that's why it's given nothing. Um, there's nothing because it's going to work in the default namespace with no, no namespace selected. You can actually change the context that kubectl works in. So this is useful if you're working with multiple clusters later down the line, uh, or if you're working in multiple namespaces and you just want to run a bunch of commands in a namespace, you can use kubectl uh, config set context and current equals, or uh, current, ah, sorry namespace equals Drupal. So that's gonna set my context that I'm in inside this cluster to be inside the Drupal namespace. So now if I run that same command, kubectl get deployments, it's inside the Drupal namespace already. So I don't have to specify dash n Drupal on every command that I run. And you can also drop out of that context by setting namespace back to nothing like that. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna work outside that context just because uh, sometimes you just need to do something quick in a namespace and so just passing dash n and then the namespace is useful enough. So uh, I'm gonna check if that's actually running. Um, yeah, it looks like everything's ready. And again, that liveness probe and readiness probe come into play when, when Kubernetes is determining if something is ready and available. Until that point is reached when port 80 is, is accessible, these will return zero of one and zero, uh, like they did somewhere up here. Yeah, up here. So, uh, let's see. So I'm I'm gonna see how we can access this. First of all, if I say kubectl get nodes, it doesn't give me their IP address, and I could look them up in here. I could go into the console, but who wants to go in here to find an IP address? That's boring and old. Uh, so I can say kubectl get nodes dash o wide. And this is a handy little trick for a lot of different resources in Kubernetes. If you just do get the basic resource, it gives you a condensed version that's easy to read even in a narrow, narrow terminal window. Uh, but if you do O wide, it gives you a lot more information, including the external IP address of the nodes. So I'm gonna grab that IP address, uh, paste it here, and then I'm gonna get the service for Drupal. So kubectl get, uh, what is it? Service dash n Drupal, and it's the Drupal service. And it's a node port exposed on this port. So I should be able to go to any node in my cluster and go to that port. And I should be able to hit Drupal from it. First time you load a Drupal page, uh, it takes a little while because Drupal has to build all its caches and things. But here's the Drupal installer. I'll quickly run through it. Uh, sure, we can use a standard install profile. And a cool thing here is since I defined in here how Drupal connects to its database and stuff, I didn't have to do that in here. Uh, like I did in the other examples, because Drupal already knows. And that's one thing that's important to keep in mind for your applications. You want to inject as much as you can into the environment and build it as much as you can into a 12-factor application. So it's easy to deploy and redeploy things. Uh, so I'm going to create a site name, uh, cube101example.com, uh, test, test, test. Highly secure passwords here. Uh, and save. No, I don't want to save that highly secure password. Oh, and there's an unexpected error. So I have to say that this didn't happen last time. And probably the easiest thing would be to just delete the thing and restart it. Uh, so I'm actually going to do that. Kubectl delete 
namespace Drupal. That's another handy thing about namespaces. If you screw things up in one, especially when you're testing things out, you can just delete the namespace and recreate it. And it, it takes a minute or so. Um, but now that, that site is gone. So th this is something where uh, I, I've actually had this problem before, especially when I'm running it on Raspberry Pis because they're a lot slower. Uh, but Drupal sometimes has issues depending on your, your storage, uh, where it writes files, if it's too slow or has some, some connectivity issues, Drupal can, can actually run into these weird race conditions in uh, cloud environments, and that has happened before. So it didn't happen when I was testing this, of course, but whenever you're doing a, a live demo, it happens. Uh, so I'm going to try building this again. Uh, oh, create namespace Drupal. Do that. Do Drupal again. Here you call it get deployments. Watch. Uh, oh, no, not Drupal. Dot YAML. Always more fun doing it live because then you get to see that uh, this is like half my life is just redoing things. Wait a second, why are there two? Oh, this is just when I'm watching it. It's showing that it's ready now. Um, whenever you do something live, you get to see that my life is not actually as perfect as my pre-recorded segments make it out to be. 90% of my life is spent deleting and recreating things, just like I'm doing here. Uh, and there will be a new port that this is running on. So now it's saying it's saying Drupal's ready. So let's see if that's the case. I'm going to get the service again, grab this port, and put it in. And let's see if it let's see if the install goes well this time. Uh, da, da, da. Installing Drupal. Uh, thank you very much, Roger, for uh, for your your uh, super chat there as well. <laughs> yes, Greg uh, mentions that the pre-recorded can be nice sometimes. So uh, cube 101, let's do this again. Test at example.com. Test, test, test. Hopefully it's not, uh, I actually found two bugs in two different things by using the username test or calling a name of something test before. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna say admin, but still use the secure password of test. Um, one of them was Ansible. A part of Ansible, I was named something test and it, well, that's great. And it, uh, and it blew things up because of that. I wonder if it's, I don't know. I, I could debug things here. I, I can also go uh, kubectl get, uh, what is it? kubectl logs dash n Drupal uh, dash f to follow dash l app equals Drupal. And this will follow the logs of any pods in here. Let's see what's happening. Uh, core install. It's showing me that it's a, f where's the... 404. That's weird. Drupal's already installed. I don't believe that it's installed because I'm getting these errors. Anyways, there's some other logs that I could get into. I'm not going to do that just because we're over time today, but I will show it doesn't matter that the Drupal website's working. Let's just say that this is this is the way Drupal works sometimes because that's actually true. Sometimes you end up with the white screen of death, they call it. And, uh, but, but this is working, but we want to scale this deployment up because we want it to really work like this on three different replicas. So I'm going to say kubectl edit uh, deployment, uh, deployment Drupal dash n Drupal. And uh, you can see that uh, also Kubernetes adds in, if you're editing things, it adds in annotations and things that aren't in my original definition. But if I reapply this, it won't overwrite anything that Kubernetes added in. Uh, so it's one easy way to update your deployments is to maintain a file like this. And then if I wanted to, I could just change this and then reapply it and it would update the replicas. I'm just doing it in the cluster itself. I'm going to put this to three and save it. And if I go back to kubectl get deployments and watch it, it says that there's one of three and only one of the three is available right now. I'm actually going to check the pods and see what's going on. Pods. I don't want to watch it. Uh, so this one is on a knit, and it should be pretty darn quick. I don't know what it's doing. Let's. I'm going to check out one of these pods. I'm going to say kubectl uh, describe pod dash n Drupal. 
and see what's going on. Let's see, multi-attach error. So here's, <coughs> here's where we start running into issues with real-world real world applications, trying to use them in Kubernetes. This is one issue that uh, you can't resolve that easily. And, and so many guides, like when, when I was uh, doing a little research work for this particular episode, I was like, I wonder how all these different getting started guides are doing it. And all of them do the same thing. They, they set up a PVC and you might notice something here, access modes, read, write, read, write once. It's so hard to say ours, especially when I haven't had a drink in a few minutes. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so read, write once means that you can attach this claim, you can attach this volume that Drupal is going to build on one container at a time. And so many tutorials out there, almost every one that I've ever seen, does the same thing because it's easy. In Kubernetes, you can, you can set up these volumes. <laughs> now it's saying it's attaching these volumes. Um, you can set up these volumes, but Kubernetes volumes and Amazon EBS and uh, Google, I forget what their volumes are called. All these different volumes can only be attached to one running container at a time. And so when you want to scale up, you can't do it because these volumes don't scale like that. So, um, you know, you're, you're throwing away a lot of functionality that Kubernetes can get you because of the fact that you chose a storage option that most tutorials will tell you to, to choose that only works with one container at a time, which is kind of crazy. Like, I want to use, I want to be able to scale up Drupal to five replicas so that I can handle a, a big traffic surge for the day that you know my website goes viral on Reddit or something. So we're gonna talk about next episode, how to take this, which is a very basic, this is similar to a lot of uh, the, the tutorials out there that you'll find a lot of the simple like, I know how to use Kubernetes, here's my thing. And it's like, well, your thing works great for like a hello world, but we're in the real world. We wanna start using our apps and scale them. So we're going to talk about uh, scaling shared files. We're going to talk about uh, different ways of doing persistence. We're going to talk about databases and how you can make them scale up uh, and different options for that. We're going to talk about DNS and TLS on your site uh, so that you can have secure HTTPS access um, and also have a, a custom domain name because you don't want to tell your customers uh, to go to an IP address. Um, and we want to talk about things like cron and how that ties in because Drupal requires a cron job to run to be able to do its own cleanup work. Uh, so please stay tuned for that next episode. Uh, it'll be next Wednesday, as always, at 11 o'clock U.S. Eastern Time. And until then, uh, I am Jeff Gearling.